Okay, now we're back, and this is, uh, hopefully you've seen the, the last, uh, last, uh, series in this, and this all makes sense, looks kind of crazy. So what we have here is we understand that when we move demand to the left, right, when we move the demand curve to the left, we decrease it, move it to the right, we increase it. The one thing we haven't, uh, we don't have here, and I'll put up in, uh, what's the color we haven't used yet? Let's, uh, let's do this in, uh... Well, I'll just use black because we haven't actually used that for a curve. So let's say we use our supply line is right here, okay, our supply curve. Okay, so this will be S1, right? So with S1, what we see is that we've got this, uh, this point of equilibrium here and here and here, depending on where our demand is. So we have an equilibrium right here, we have an equilibrium there, and then we have an equilibrium right here. So these are our three points of equilibrium, right? Because we, and we've already talked about this, so hopefully that's all clear. So equilibrium here is going to be matched here, here, and here. So let's number these points. One, two, and three. That was the best uh, three I've had uh, lately. So at this price here, we look at when, when... So this is a standard demand. Equilibrium has a price of, um, you know, whatever. At this price... Actually, we have Q2 is where um, our price at $10 is right where we're at right here, right? We come over, we see that at equilibrium here, now when we go left, when we move the demand curve to the left this way, what happens? Now look at our price. It's somewhere around 8 or 9, right? If we were to plot that out, let's call that 8, okay? Now if we look over here, what happens? Because when we move our demand curve to the right, with our supply curve, we intersect at a higher price. And if we were to plot this out we hit whatever that price is, let's call it 15. The fives and the threes are causing issue here. 15, right? Okay, so we've got whatever price this is. So this is eight and that's 15. So we see that because our supply doesn't change, if we move demand, that changes our overall price. And at this price, suppliers are happier because they're making more money. And the equilibrium has actually changed. So anytime we move, this just illustrates that we, when we're looking at our supply line, it doesn't. we could pick one price and buyers want more. The, the quantity demanded, um, or the actual demand itself, not just the quantity demanded, that um, there are more units being sold at each pr at any price we go at. There's more sold as we move to the right. But also our equilibrium price is actually higher. This is the price that buyers and sellers are going to come to and um, this is the agreed upon price. Make sense? So hopefully that uh, that's clear. It's just like this. If we're looking here at our graph, we have two lines. We have D1 and S1. If we move this way, if we move our demand curve this way, we have a higher corresponding price, right? Because this was our previous equilibrium. This is our new one. If we move it to the left, we have a lower price. This is our new, uh, this is all our equilibrium price. Look at that, I'm getting carried away with the uh, the handwriting. Okay, so this is our equilibrium price. Uh, <laughs> look at that E. Okay, um, the, these are our different prices. So we're always going to be higher as we move to the left. Make sense? Okay, so that really gives us an idea of where we want to move the curve and that we always want to move it it's from Jack's point of view. Remember, Jack is our, in our last few, he's our supplier here. Right, when we come down to Jack. So from his point of view, he wants this demand curve to move to the right, okay? He doesn't want it to go to the left, and assuming that supply stays the same, that's how he will, uh, you know, the equilibrium then comes to a higher and higher price. And also, in order for us to be inelastic, he needs to be at the bottom half of our line, right? This should be uh, all remedial, right? So we take any line, this is what brings us to this, uh, what, what we talked about briefly before, this uh, acronym, of all, A-L-L. -L. And we're going to come, this is basically angular, linear, and lateral. This gives us an idea of what we want to do with our, our curve. But let's, uh, before we get to that, let's look at what actually is going to move this demand curve. Okay, so we have two things that happen. We know that if we pick a point on this demand curve, let's go ahead and label our items. This is price, this is quantity, this is uh, our origin zero. If we have a movement along this curve, right, that's going to be a change in the quantity demanded. That's not really going to make a big difference to Jack, right? But what we want to do as, the, um, as we're looking at creating in inelasticity is we want to make sure that we're moving the demand curve and we want to move it to the right. But in general, what moves, what determines whether or not the demand curve moves 
to the right or to the left. Let's use some scenarios here. We'll use uh, we'll say that we've got our supplier. In this case, we've talked we've been talking about Jack. We'll continue to name him Jack. And then we've got uh, let's call him our buyer is John. Okay, John. Very beautiful handwriting there, right? John. Jack is much more eligible than uh, than John. So um, John is our, our buyer, uh, buyer here. Jack is our supplier. Okay, so let's say that John. This represent John represents all the buyers, potential buyers for Jack, and Jack is. Uh, let's say we're in the uh, he's selling TVs here. Okay, he's in the the TV business. All right. So what is going to? There's basically two things that are going to happen with demand. We're either going to move on some point along the curve, right? Like this, when we move from point A to point B, that's going to be a movement along the curve, right? So that's going to be. We'll put that over here. We're basically moving along, okay? And then we have an actual movement in the curve, or what we call lateral movement, right? So that would be lateral actually moving it, right? That's an actual movement of the curve. So we're actually going to see movement, and in this case, we're talking about lateral movement. So let's talk about what, let's, uh, let's say, what would be an example of, of you know how do we actually move the demand curve versus the quantity demanded? Let's say that John, and this represents John. So let's say that John um, gets gets a raise at work. Okay, if he gets a raise, he has more income, he has more money, and he goes out and buys a TV. How would we represent that here? Would that be a change along the curve, or would it be an actual lateral movement? Okay, just think about that. What did you come up with? John is, all of a sudden has more money to go out and buy TVs. John and the 10 million buyers he represents all get a raise and they have enough money to go out and buy a TV. What would happen? Is that going to move the curve right or left or is it going to move along the curve? Dink, 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 dink. We're thinking, using our heads. Okay, if you said mo lateral movement, you're absolutely right because that would be lateral movement, right? Let me mark that here. That would be lateral movement. Now what about if uh, John all of a sudden uh, gets, uh, let's say he gets married. Let's say John goes out and gets married. What happens? Uh, let's say that he gets married and him and his wife uh, want to watch TV all day. They want to put it, he gets a new house. Because he got married, he got a new house, and he needs to buy more TVs. Is that going to be lateral movement? Or is that going to actually be movement along the curve? That's going to be lateral movement too, right? Now, if you're wondering why is it lateral movement and lot movement along the curve, let's say the price of... Um, Let's say that uh, John, uh, that, let's say he buys NFL stuff. He's, a, he's really into the NFL stuff. And let's say the price for NFL, uh, whatever the package is, the price for the NFL stuff, the NFL package, goes up. Okay? So what happens then? That is going to be a lateral movement as well, either increase or decrease. It's probably going to be a decrease because the price went up. But what we're seeing here, let's say that the actual price on TV is there was some uh, shortage on some good in China or wherever the televisions were made, and all of a sudden the, the producers, the suppliers raised the price for TVs. What's that going to be? Is that going to be a lateral movement or is that going to move along the curve? That's going to move along the curve, right? That's going to be right here. Now, let's talk about what the difference is, because I haven't really covered that. I'm just telling you what the answer is, which is probably not the best way, but I just want to, because I know some of you are already uh, putting this together. Here is the secret. If we want to move along the curve, and this is like one of the biggest secrets in all of business and pricing. If we want to move along this curve, okay, we, that, that change will be represented if there's a change in price or quantity. In other words, we have to change something on the x or y axis. We have to change something here or here. We have to change something along this y or along this x axis. Makes sense? Because when, when we say, for example, that uh, John gets married, how would we represent that here? There's no representation for that, right? How would we represent that here in quantity? There's no representation for that either, right? So it's going to be a change that is not reflected on our two variables, your price and quantity. Makes sense? If the price for the NFL uh, package went up, that would be a price issue. But that's a price issue not relating to TVs. That's a price issue related to another graph. So that does not, 
now that is a, a complimentary good because that's something that you use with the television. But that does that's not going to be represented here. Does that make sense? So here is the big secret to in order to start this process of creating elasticity. One of the top big, you know, big secrets here is that you have to manipulate, you have to work with the variable other than price or quantity. So if you want to move the demand curve, if you want to change the demand curve, you have, and assuming that we're just looking at price and quantity, you need to adjust something other than price, okay? And this is a huge issue that people generally don't mess. We need to change something. Wow, I got to fix that. We need to change something other than price okay because anything that we change on price is going to be represented here and it's not going to change our demand does that make sense and we understand how important that is to move this demand because unless you do that you're just changing the quantity demanded make sense so we need to change something other than price and this is where we enter what's called our DCS our demand curve standardizers, demand curve standardizing. This is how we actually move our demand curve. This is the part where most economists will disagree with me because a lot of these people study this to understand it, to measure stuff with governments, things like that. They don't really understand it or spend time studying it to learn how to change it, how to use it to your favor. So this gives us, this brings us to determinants of demand. We'll be at, we'll start on a new page now. And this is where we really start moving on to the, uh, how you actually adjust this, okay? So these are our, I'll do this in black, determinants of demand, okay? If you spend time studying any of this, you'll realize that in order for you to have any meaningful control over demand, we need to understand the determinants outside of, um, outside of our uh, price. And this kind of, we use an analogy for this, T-I- GRS, tigers, like lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, that's an E right there. Analogies are great for uh, using with uh, understanding and comprehension. And Matisse is one who actually came up with this. So this stands for taste, income, expectations, goods related, and substitutes. Or, I'm sorry, um, the substitutes is within goods related. Um, S is for size of the market. So if we go up here, these are our essentially our determinants of demand. So we have taste. And this is, can also be in preferences, what people prefer. Then we have income, income of the people that uh, you are talking about. Expectations, and this is going to be expectations are a little, uh, we'll talk about each one a little bit more, but um, really this is going to come down to expectations on price, expectations on the market. This is goods related or related goods. And within good, within related goods, we've got two main groups there and then s is uh size so within goods related we have uh basically two groups we have substitutes and we have complements that's an s complementary goods and substitutes goods so a substitute is something you buy in place of something else so instead of a tv you buy a projector or a computer so when the price or the the demand of a substitute goes up usually the one for our uh one in question here will go down. So let's go back to our TV. If you bought something other than a TV, like let's say a lot of people are using a computer or there's a lot of sites where a computer or an iPad or something could be replaced or could replace the functionality or the usefulness of a television. As the iPad, so if we have a substitute here, as the demand, as the uh, as the, the market for the, the substitute goes up generally, the... Uh, the demand or the it will have an inverse relationship with TVs. Now with complements, for example, like what's a complement to a TV? Something like the NFL package, right? As this goes up, uh, if the if the price goes up, then the price will go down for TVs. But if the market goes up, for if more people are buying uh, the NFL packages, then it would make sense since they're bought together generally that the price of TVs or the not the price but that the demand the the actual demand curve itself would shift as well. So a good example would be um, MP3s, iTunes, and iPad, you know, um, iPhones and things like that, whole market that Apple created. So there's complements and substitutes. Those are two different types of uh, goods when we come back, when we come down here. This is stuff that, this is, and there's so much more than this. This is just a small, any combo, you could combine any of these, or there could just be something, I'm letting my handwriting go as we move along here. 
It could be a combination or something outside of all of this, right? It could just be just, you know, stuff happens. It could be anything, right? It could be any, anything can change the demand that's not represented on this graph with price. But what this also tells us, and this is the part where we really get, um, we get moving into what we really are going to spend a lot of our time talking about, is that if you want to raise your price, if Jack over here wants to raise his price, if he wants to move along this line, he can try just changing the price. But if he does that without changing anything else, all he's going to do, we, have, we know our supply curve comes in through here, right? I'm just going to have it dotted. Okay? Because it's going to be a little... We know that if he changes his price, all he's going to do is change the quantity demanded. Does that make sense? So he's still going to have a... Like if he just raises his price and he doesn't change... So let's say he goes from our equilibrium point here to um, our P1 here to P2. If he doesn't change anything, all he's going to end up with is basically a surplus, right? He's not going to sell because we're going to have the point here, right, where we're going to hit our demand curve and we're going to hit our supply curve here. And this part here is going to have a surplus, so he's not really going to sell that product, right? So if he, if in order to be, kind of build our elasticity, we're learning a few interesting things. And this is where, we, where our all comes in here, right? And this is, again... We're moving past the academic part and into the actual part that you guys are going to be doing with companies. When we look at our uh, the whole point of our uh, our uh, understanding this right here, this is where when people have problems with price or they have problems with commoditizing, what happens if you don't control this? If you don't find a way to um, to standardize this, you are going to be a commodity. Whatever, and almost everyone is in this category where they're not really doing anything to differentiate themselves or to change um, anything about their company or their products. So they're basically always at the mercy of the market. They're just another provider. They're just another blank. There's no real specialization that happens. And this is the game they're trying to compete on: price and quantity. So anytime they're they're just it's it's like you think about this. How are you going to move this curve by adjusting price? It's not going to happen, right? You, you can move along the curve, which is what most 99% of companies do, but they don't actually move the curve. In order to move the curve, we have to adjust something other than price. Makes sense? That's the point of bringing this up. So when we talk about all here, what we're looking at is angular, linear, and lateral. So we've talked about our demand curve, right? First, we want to make sure we have the angular. Let me put this down here. First, we want to make sure that when we talk about what half do we want to be on, right? This is our midpoint. What half do we want to be on? We want to be right here, right? We've already talked about that. So that's the bottom half. We, and our angle, by the way, we've talked about this in this episode or in this uh, previously right here, right? We want our, our steep angle so that a, a high change in price results in a very limited change in quantity demanded, where this essentially will always result if we shaded this area in like we did last time. Or actually, we did this before, and uh, let me find that. Right here, is this? Yeah, okay, see, when we, if, if, it's, if it's elastic, then you're, you're, kind of, you're going to be kind of at the mercy. So in order to create this inelastic effect where we can raise prices, and this assume you know, we're going to get to the actual service and making sure that Jack is doing a good job and he's justifying it and that he's taking care of the people. But that, um, first we want to understand the concept here. We want this, this is our angle. We want that steep angle. So anytime you're talking to a company, I, guys, I want you guys to remember this. Keep that steep angle, angle in mind. We don't want a shallow angle. We, want, we don't want any of this happening where we go to the left. This is our lateral movement. We want a steep angle. Let me pull our page up. Okay, so we want... Here it is. We have our angle. We want it to be steep, right? Linear. Along this linear curve, we want to be in the bottom half, right? And then lateral. This is our lateral movement. We want to be constantly moving to the right. So just understanding these three things, angular, linear, and lateral, gives us an idea of how we want Jack's demand curve to be. So these are the items here. and It's this or a combination, anything outside of this, but essentially anything other than price. Right? Anything other than price, that's what's going to give us that control. That's what's going to give us that movement where we have that inelasticity. So let's talk briefly about each of these uh, these items. Your tastes and preferences are you know, just what people are wanting. There's different ways to, uh, to work with that. These are basically, and I mentioned this earlier, our uh, DCS is our demand curve 
standardizing. This is how we essentially change the demand. See, I know that I'm talking, I'm trying to get uh, standardizing, so uh, it's going to be a little tight here. Okay, standardizing. Okay, uh, demand curve standardizing, and that basically means that what we demand curve standardizing comes down to this idea where we're taking each of these items here within our uh, the angular linear and um, lateral movement and we are creating this movement along our demand so we, this can be done with any business we've done this again and again we're gonna go over several examples later but um, okay so let, let's finish talking about these items here um, taste and preferences of what people are wanting essentially these things can all be suggested there's it comes down to there's a few simple ways to change any one of these or to change all of these income the income of your market um, you know not necessarily it's not this um, it's not necessary you know what I'm actually we're gonna have to I'm thinking should we keep going why don't we okay we'll end this video and then we'll come back up and we'll t we'll finish this off and we'll talk about uh, Getting the rest of these uh, the rest of these items done, and then exactly what your what the assignment will be from this. Okay, all right. So we'll come back up and we'll go from there.